John Keats lived just 25 short years, and yet his name is synonymous with the Romantic poetry movement. With Keats becoming one of its most famous figures, along with fellow Romantic poets Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley and Byron. Keats did indeed die young, which adds to his tragic and romantic image. The Romantic Age certainly celebrated youth, a time of great genius and natural insight. Fellow Romantic poet Wordsworth wrote, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Youth was a time when the world could be seen through fresh eyes, before age, responsibility and boring old reason took over. The early death of Keats, and shortly afterwards Shelley and Byron's equally premature ends, adds weight to the cultural idea that genius is born of the young. It blossoms briefly, then disappears. We still hold on to this ideal today. Think of our romanticisation of Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse and Jim Morrison. Keats does seem to have blossomed in his youth, and despite being on earth for such a short time, he has certainly left behind a substantial body of work. Lucky for us. John Keats was born in London on the 31st of October 1795. His mother, Frances Jennings, was described as a handsome little woman and later by one of her other sons, George, as an excellent and affectionate parent. She was, by all accounts, pretty, capable and vivacious. She was also rather strong-willed, a trait apparently inherited by Keats himself. Keats's father, Thomas, was a short, thick-set man with brown hair and eyes, described as having good sense and being very much liked. Keats's parents were both short in stature, which probably explains his own adult height of five feet nothing. And to be just five feet tall was considered pretty short for a man, even by the standards of the time. It seems that the marriage of Keats's parents, Thomas and Francis, was a good one. They were young when they married, he was just 20 and she 19. Our very own John Keats was born first, followed later by George, Tom and younger sister Fanny. Thomas Keats provided well for his family, but these were perilous times. Overseas we have the ongoing French Revolution, which was changing the shape of Europe. There was always the threat of invasion. We also had a UK Tory government at that time that was pretty ruthless and forceful against anyone who challenged the established order. As a child, Keats was apparently rather precocious, often the way with clever children who seem more advanced than their years. A neighbour of the Keats family said that as a child, Keats would make a rhyme out of the last word a person said and then laugh, which in fairness does sound rather annoying. Keats was also prone to letting his temper get the better of him. This trait seems to have lasted throughout his short life. When he was just a young boy, Keats apparently, quote, got hold of a naked sword and shutting the front door, swore nobody could go out. His mother wanted to do so, but he threatened her. So furiously she began to cry and was obliged to wait till somebody through the window saw her position and came to the rescue. This is a very second-hand account, though, a kind of retelling of a retelling by Benjamin Robert Hayden, a friend of Keats, who was apparently prone to exaggeration. Undeniably, though, Keats was very like his mother. They both had reddish hair, high foreheads and wide mouths. They were also very close, and she rather indulged him. There are some who say that his complex feelings about his mother affected his later attitude towards relationships with women. John and his next brother George had started at a good boarding school called Enfield, run by the headmaster John Clark. The school was noted for providing a home away from home and was considered to be distinctly progressive. The boys started there in the summer of 1803 in uniforms that featured a frilled collar, a short jacket with pearl buttons and a tasseled cap. Keats was settled at school and the family were doing well, but this was not to last. It was after their father visited the boys at school 
that a terrible accident occurred. Thomas Keats was returning from his visit when he was thrown from his horse. He was found unconscious and died within hours. This left poor Francis, just 29 years old, widowed with four children. How did she react? Not well. For a short time she vanished, running away to who knows where, probably taking a daughter with her. She returned a few months later. Frances was clearly desperate and probably unstable, as evidenced by her decision to remarry less than two months later. She married a William Rawlins, of whom we know very little, we can assume he wasn't much use, though, based on the fact that he wasn't liked by her family and the marriage didn't last long. After the failure of this second marriage, Frances ran away again, leaving her four children in the care of her mother, Alice Jennings, who was by now 69 years old and probably not in the mood to take care of four lively grandchildren. Where did Frances go? We're not entirely sure though there were rumours she went to live with another man and began drinking heavily. When she resurfaced a few years later, she was depressed and ill, showing signs of tuberculosis or TB. She moved back into her mother's home and Keats appointed himself her principal nurse, caring for her passionately and with great devotion. He was devastated when she eventually died. When he returned to school after her death, he was withdrawn and sometimes hid away from his friends and teachers. He never moaned about being an orphan, but did later admit that his greatest misfortune had been that he had no mother. After his mother's death, and for reasons that are unclear, Alice Jennings, the grandmother, appointed two London merchants, Richard Abbey and John Rowland Sandal, to be the guardians of the Keats children. Sandal is a shadowy figure. He didn't seem overly involved in the care of the Keats children. Abby is much more significant. He was a prosperous tea broker. He was also cruel, stern and malicious. Abby thought the Keats children overindulged and tainted by the weakness of their parents. Abby also wasn't too keen on Enfield School, where John and George and now younger brother Tom still attended. He thought it subversive rather than progressive. When Keats was 15, Abby withdrew Keats from Enfield to apprentice with an apothecary surgeon and study medicine in a London hospital. This seems a natural progression for Keats. He had played the role of nurse to his mother in the final months of her life after all. He spent four years as an apprentice and then registered as a student at St Guy's Hospital. As Keats set out on his career as a doctor, he also began his life as a poet. He would still see Charles Cowden Clark, the son of his old Enfield headmaster, who would visit Keats on the weekends with various books. These books and Clark's visits expanded both Keats's literary knowledge and his imagination. Keats was first published as a poet in a politically independent and radical magazine called The Examiner. Lee Hunt, pictured here, was the editor of the magazine. Keats was already a great admirer of Lee Hunt, having borrowed copies of the Examiner from Clark. Hunt also had some pretty cool friends known as the Hunt Circle, a kind of in-crowd of devoted artists and thinkers, which included William Hazlitt and the poet Percy Shelley. On later meeting Hunt and being absorbed into the Hunt Circle, Keats found his inspiration his great admiration for Hunt clear, clearly influenced his early work. In 1817, Keats's collection of poems was published. He followed this with a rather disastrous foray into epic poetry writing. Endymion, a 4,000 line allegorical romance based on a Greek myth, has moments of great beauty, but is frankly a bit of a mess. It was written in true Keats style, i.e. very quickly, and was utterly trashed by the critics. We'll look at this in more detail later in the course. At the same time he was experiencing the wrath of the critics, Keats's brother, George, emigrated to America. And sadly, Keats's other brother, Tom, became very sick with TB. 
True to form, Keats started to care for him. This proved to be a very difficult time in the young poet's life. Keats had something of a break as his brother's condition improved a little. This gave him the opportunity to go travelling with another friend of his, Charles Brown. In August of 1818, they travelled to the north and to Scotland. During the trip, Keats visited the grave of Robert Burns. He wasn't hugely impressed. Walking trips like this were very fashionable with writers of the period. The mighty William Wordsworth had made his trip in 1803. On returning home, sadly, Tom's illness had returned with a vengeance. Keats resumed his bedside vigil, nursing Tom until his death in December of 1818. At about the same time his brother was ill and dying, Keats met Fanny Braun. She was a friend of a friend of sorts, and at first Keats was critical of her. This soon turned to intense love. The beginning of their relationship also marks the beginning of what we call the living year. The living year is the period of intense activity from Keats, when he produ produced his most beautiful poetry, including the odes. In December 1819, Keats and Fanny became secretly engaged. Illness and financial problems meant they couldn't marry. A broke, sickly poet was hardly ideal husband material in those days. Keats couldn't support himself, let alone afford to take a wife. Keats tried to write some plays around this time to earn some money, but was unsuccessful. It's almost inevitable that Keats would become ill with TB himself, after nursing Tom through the last stages of his illness. He was plagued by many worries and rejected as a writer. He realised he would never be able to marry his beloved Fanny Braun. His letters to her during this period reveal that he became jealous and possessive of her. Keats suffered a serious haemorrhage in February of 1819, coughing up blood. He knew what it meant. He had medical training after all. He said to a friend, I know the colour of that blood. It is arterial blood. I cannot be deceived in that colour. That drop of blood is my death warrant. I must die. He did recover a little under the care of his friends, but after another serious haemorrhage, it was decided that he should go abroad as the warmer climate was thought to help. The funds for the trip were raised by his friends. In the later months of 1820, Keats set off for Italy and warmer climes, with the painter Joseph Seven, a close friend. They travelled to Naples initially and then on to Rome, but it was too late. Keats's condition declined. On the 23rd of February, 1821, Keats died. Andrew Motion sensitively describes Keats' death in his biography. As the evening darkened, Keats suddenly stirred and clutched at Seven, imploring him, lift me up, I am dying, I shall die easy, don't be frightened, thank God it has come. Seven leaned across the bed and took Keats in his arms, but as the thickly taken breaths persisted, he slowly released him and straightened again, keeping hold of his left hand. They remained in silence while the last glow of the sun gave way to candlelight the mucus boiling in Keats's throat as he became too weak even to cough. At one point a cold, heavy sweat broke out over his whole body and he whispered warningly, Don't breathe on me, it comes like ice. Seven kept immovable, on the verge of sleep. As eleven o'clock approached, he jolted awake and looked again at his friend. Keats was dead, his face so composed that Seven still thought he slept. He is buried in the Protestant cemetery in Rome. Keats's last request was to be placed under a tombstone bearing no name or date, only the words, here lies one whose name was writ in water. Seven and Brown organised the headstone, adding a relief of a lyre with broken strings. This was to show how his classical genius was cut off by death before its maturity. <laughs>